our next speaker is Dr. Alan Walkie. Um, and he'll be talking about facilitating learning health system with translational sciences, lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Walkie is a professor of medicine uh, in the section of pul pulmonary, pulmonary, pulmonary allergy, sleep, and critical care. And he is an, uh, a critical care physician in pulmonology. He's a, an associate professor and he has um, uh, uh, an affiliation with the Public Health School, uh, Law and Policy and Management. He's an investigator with the Framingham Heart Study, um, and uh, he is the co-director of the BU uh, Evans Center for Implementation and Kidney Sciences. He runs the CIIS. Um, and uh, Dr. Walkie is going to talk to us today. Um, Dr. Walkie. Thank you so much, Dr. Shanahan. Uh, can everyone hear me? Can hear me okay? See my slides? Great. You're good. Thanks so much for the invitation to speak today and for um, Dr. Bear Merritt and Dr. Center for <coughs> leading this, um, the, the CTSI towards this symposium that uh, Dr. Shanahan's done such a wonderful job organizing with uh, Raina Stuppert as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking about facilitating a learning health system with translational science lessons learned from the COVID pandemic. First, I'm going to I think um, repeat uh, very briefly some of the uh, things that Dr. Cheng discussed in such wonderful detail about the stark early lessons of, of COVID. Um, going to transition then to what is a learning health system and how might a learning health system start to help us address some of these stark lessons? And how did COVID jumpstart um, the, the beginnings of a learning health system here locally and how the, those local beginnings actually expanded nationally and internationally and how translational science and translational learning can help us put together some of the pieces of a learning health system and then finish with some future and ongoing directions. So what were these stark lessons? I think we uh, know uh, clearly from uh, our experiences in Dr. Chang's talk that um, COVID shined a light, that our patients uh, served by our safety net hospital were disproportionately impacted by COVID and simultaneously were underrepresented in COVID research. They, our patients did not have opportunities to participate in research at the beginning of the pandemic and that these systemic problems were always present, but COVID really just shined a light on the starkness of what we faced and I think jarred us out of some prior relative complacency, showing us that we rapidly needed to identify strategy to reduce inequity, increase research participation, and discover optimal strategies for treating our patients. So how? Well, I'll argue that one way, um, either subconsciously or uh, later consciously, we started to think about how to uh, improve the, the way that we functioned as a learning health system. So what's a learning health system? The Institute of Medicine uh, wrote about the concept of a learning health system in 2007 as a system in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process and patients and families all active participants in all the elements and where new knowledge is captured as a byproduct of the usual care experience. So there's a lot of information in that definition and I think we'll reflect on that information throughout this talk. The AHRQ, the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality has tried to distill a lot of that into this um, cartoon or figure which shows that Routine practice generates data and that researchers can interact with that data to create new evidence that's seamlessly, in, in the ideal state, integrated back into practice in partnership with stakeholders, our clinical and community stakeholders. So a learning health system has seven core competencies that are required to function ideally and, efficiency and, effi and efficiently. Those core competencies include implementation science, research methods, informatics, health system science, ethics, community engagement, and help a focus on health equity. And over the course of today, you're going to hear talks that focus on each of these pieces of the puzzle. Um, but 
really what a learning health system needs is something to help us assemble the pieces of the puzzle. We have all of these components and many health systems have all these components, but it's putting together these pieces of the puzzle in a way that helps our community. That, that's the difficult part. And so translational science, which is the science that seeks to understand the scientific and operational principles that underlie the translational process, I'll argue, will help us to learn how to put together the pieces of these puzzles in a way to obtain a functioning learning health system. And that the qualities of a translational scientist, including boundary crossing, process innovation, rigorous research, are needed to help us learn to assemble these pieces. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to very briefly discuss three examples where we began to put together pieces of a learning health system. And um, I think at the beginning, we're not thinking about this as a learning health system, but then started to, uh, I think, consciously think of about this as a learning health system, which I think started to accelerate some of our learning. So these three examples I'll discuss are um, how we began uh, here and spread internationally uh, a virus, what's called the virus COVID registry in partnership with the Society of Critical Care Medicine, how we started here and again disseminated internationally um, Nick Bosch's uh, smartphone guided prone positioning randomized control trial and how uh, Ben Linus, who you'll hear from today, in which I'll touch on very briefly, started the BMC Clinical Research Network and the Massachusetts Community Engagement Alliance to help us um, better engage our patients in research, and how all of these three components actually began to inform each other in what I think was the start of a learning health system. This iterative learning is key to a learning health system approach. So let's start with the COVID registry. At the beginning of COVID, we knew nothing, we needed to learn things, and so one way to learn things is start collecting data, and we started to collect data on our patients in an organized fashion, and with the help of the Society of Critical Care Medicine and some funding partners, we're able to turn this into a registry where Boston Medical Center was the first uh, uploading of data to the registry. And I was one of the uh, co-principal investigators that really had the, the honor of participating in this registry that by now has 306 sites so over 28 countries and multiple continents and has enrolled 86,000 patients. The registry work, like much of the work that was done in early COVID was through volunteerism. So we had more than 20 volunteers here to enter this data manually from our patients. And this spirit of volunteerism, while it spurred much of our early work, uh, as you'll see, began to wane, and we, need, we needed things that were more long-lasting. But the COVID registry for our very first paper, to uh, use the data from the registry, what we wanted to do was learn about variation in outcomes for our patients with COVID. So we looked across uh, the hospitals that at this point had contributed uh, quality data, which was about 84 hospitals, and um, we looked at their outcomes for patients who were requiring a ventilator with COVID. And as you can see from this figure, these hospitals are sorted in order of uh, worsening mortality. So um, what is starkly shown here is that some hospitals for their patients with COVID who require mechanical ventilation had relatively good mortality rates for mechanically ventilated patients. 20 to 30% is about what we saw before COVID and what these patients were achieving for patients with COVID. But unfortunately, there were lots of hospitals that were achieving not so great mortality rates of 60 to 70%. Now, these mortality rates for this study were adjusted for um, everything we could adjust for, um, multiple covariates, including acute illness severity, and uh, chronic comorbidities, but despite that, we see still saw large differences in patient outcomes. So obviously this is something that needs to be addressed and that spurred a lot of study. But one study that uh, it spurred that I wanted to focus on today was our Center for Implementation Improvement Sciences partnered with um, the CDC and with uh, our uh, register with the Society of Critical Care Medicine to focus on what was going on in these mort mortality outlier hospitals, um, to look at differences in implementation approaches 
and practices to try to understand why some hospitals are doing great and some hospitals doing not so great. So this is work in progress. It's unpublished work uh, in all of its caveats. But um, we interviewed the ICU nursing and uh, medical leaders from all of the high and low performing hospitals. And two major themes started to separate out between the high and low mortality hospitals. And these themes were around the implementation climates within the hospitals and the engagement of the hospital leadership. So the low mortality, high performing hospitals actually had an implementation climate where they focused their implementation only on things that were high quality evidence and they were not distracted by lots of the um, other things that were going on that you know were maybe helpful, uh, had some potential um, mechanistic benefit, but unproven, but really just focused on providing the highest evidence care the best they could. Whereas the high mortality hospitals uh, were implementing things rapidly with a trial and error approach, but without generally the framework to determine whether this was an error or whether they were getting benefit. The other big theme that emerged was leadership engagement, that the low mortality hospitals, there was direct engagement and uh, continuous communication between the clinical and administrative leaders, whereas in the higher mortality, lower performing hospitals, there was a distinct separation between leadership and clinicians, and that separation was not breached. And, uh, and so these two themes were highly differential between the, the hospitals. And so um, what's important about this work is that these things are highly modifiable. So these things we can learn from and then feed back into the system to try to find work, uh, ways to improve implementation climate and leadership engagement. So again, example of learning from our usual care and feeding it back to help improve things in the future. So the registry did a number of other things that began to take on the forms of a learning health system. So first, it started a learning ICU collaborative where the participating uh, health centers and hospitals in the registry began to have the data fed back to them. The results like the mortality graph that I showed you before were fed back to hospitals. They could see where they were uh, on, and start to try to improve. There was also a learning community that formed with weekly presentations and meetings where things like uh, ICU management of specific conditions related to COVID were discussed. Clinical support tools such as rounding checklists were disseminated and learning modules were put online with regards to delivering patient and family centered care, addressing burnout and managing disparities in triage. So all things relevant to COVID. Um, the registry has thus far published 20 research articles, again, contributing hopefully to learning. And lastly, and more, most currently, the registry's infrastructure is now being used to try to build a new infrastructure for trial informatics that I will briefly touch on. So in partnership with multiple partners, you can see the registry here in the middle, um, the infrastructure of the registry is now being used to try to develop reliable and way to extract automatically without the manual input that we had in early COVID, but automated data extraction from the electronic health record. And the goal of this automated data extraction is to be able to uh, provide efficient infrastructure to conduct large scale platform trials in partnership with the FDA and uh, this group, the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory and Cure ID to study repurposing of drugs for future pandemics in a controlled fashion and also uh, for sepsis in, in the interpandemic periods. Hopefully that will happen someday. So uh, this is just, uh, and Bill Adams, who you'll hear from talking today is central to, to this uh, effort here. So again, a, a way that the registry has uh, started to learn from its own actions to try to inform larger efforts. Other learning from the registry inform other efforts. So our registry um, showed that about 15% of patients were receiving um, prone positioning when they were awake and not intubated. So while intubated patients receiving prone positioning, which is lying on your stomach um, as an evidence-based uh, care process, 
awake non-intubated patients on oxygen uh, proning is not was not evidence based and so but lots of patients were getting it the new york times was starting to report on it and we knew very little about whether it helped so um nick bosch uh and and mostly nick bosch uh started this trial here with the translation with the translational science question of how can we conduct a trial during a pandemic and a clinical question of does awake prone positioning help? So I'll discuss this briefly because really the innovation of this trial was that all the instructions to, from the trial for the inpatients who consented were delivered via text message. So once patients were consented, uh, their phone was the way the trial was delivered because it's a pandemic and study coordinators can't be going into the rooms. So patients would get a welcome text message like this, Teach, showing them about the trial. Nick Bosch, our uh, principal investigator, was showing them how to prone. So here's Nick uh, doing that with pictures that were sent by a text message. Data about the trial was collected. How, how long were paid, was the intervention being delivered? What were symptoms? As well as some electronic health record outcomes that were collected. But much of this trial was delivered and outcomes selected by a text message. So what happened in this trial? Well, I think we had, uh, the good news is equitable participation. So overall and locally, the, um, the trial reflected the community served. So uh, remarkably in a year, uh, 304 patients were, collect, were uh, enrolled over 12 centers, in, uh, including international um, centers with race ethnicity distribution that equaled that of the US census. Something we had strived for to improve equity in our trial participation here, and I think accomplished. So that, that's good news. We did have translational learning, so uh, but the learning was probably not so great news that smartphone-based trials in the inpatient setting were insufficient alone for delivery. So only 60% of consented participants opened their text messages, 47% reported what body position they were uh, using and only 36% of those who were randomized to the trone, prone group uh, lied prone for greater than six hours, which was the intended um, uh, delivery. So I think similar to the um, colonoscopy trial that we've read all about recently, where the uh, intention to deliver the intervention was uh, not met with large participation in the intervention. And so there we were uh, not really able to assess the effectiveness outcome as uh, reliably as we uh, wanted to in the intention to treat group. Um, and one of the things that happened with this trial is we had a 50 member all volunteer team. So again, like the registry, huge group of volunteerism and excitement to participate in helping our patients with COVID. Um, but that volunteer team is unstable. This trial was conducted a uh, multi-center randomized trial for zero dollars and zero cents in funding. And so eventually the trial was stopped for slow enrollment. And we realized we needed better ways to engage patients in trials and a better trial infrastructure. So this is where Ben Linus and his clinical research network come in and he'll tell you much more in detail as the day goes on about um, how he is really focusing in his group on uh, combining community engagement, scientific innovation uh, to uh, allow us to better uh, conduct trials and how uh, th he's also leading the Massachusetts Community Engagement Alliance, which is focused on asking questions about how we can get our community uh, involved in COVID vaccination as well as research participation. So let me, uh, because I'm also participating in Massachusetts SEAL as well, talk a little bit about how all the things that I've discussed today are starting to come together. So the Massachusetts SEAL group is now embarking on studies to identify barriers and facilitators to research participation in our community. So the results, uh, the participants in Nick Bosch's uh, smartphone guided prone positioning trial are being recontacted. The Massachusetts SEAL group is interviewing these participants to ask them about um, what it's like to participate in research, what are the things that would make them uh, more likely to participate in research, what are the things that make them less likely to participate in research, and our, our interviewing investigators on campus with similar questions about barriers and facilitators to participating in research. 
And the hope is then that this information can be fed back to the trials, such as the ones that are intended with the discovery virus um, registry infrastructure that is being now um, converted into a platform trial infrastructure. So again, this cyclical learning that is happening where all the things we're doing are informing all the things we're doing is really the goal of a learning health system. And this iterative learning um, was really triggered in many ways by, by COVID. So what are some of the things that are happening now and in the future that I didn't have a chance to talk about today? Well, there's a ton that I didn't have a chance to talk about today and um, that other speakers today will talk about. But a few things I wanted to briefly touch on. Um, we need to expand opportunities that purposefully meld team members with different learning health system competencies. So that is translational science, learning how to do that. The BMC Health Equity Accelerator is purposefully doing this in many ways. And I think um, we'll see uh, great uh, accomplishments from them in the future from their doing this. We need to expand training and workforce development in le learning health system competencies. Uh, our Center of Implementation Improvement Science, uh, supported by the CTSI, has started an implementation science fellowship that's trying to expand training and workforce development in one of the competencies. Again, uh, we need to do more. And lastly, um, we need to expand research in the translational science of linking together these learning healthcare system competencies. How do we put together these pieces of the learning health system puzzle. There's much to learn there. So in summary, early COVID exposed gaps in our clinical research and um, uh, clin our clinical and research infrastructure. So our, our practice part, we've learned from that. Um, conceptualizing our data infrastructure through a learning health system lens has helped us extract new knowledge from the existing data, from existing um, opportunities and has allowed us to target areas for workforce development and research, and that this new evidence is then fed back to improve sub subsequent clinical care and research. So these are things that we're just starting to do and hopefully uh, the future can, can expand in partnership with uh, CTSI. So um, thank you uh, very much. Uh, subsequent talks today will highlight the additional work in learning health system competencies of community engagement, informatics, and equity. And um, multiple pieces of the puzzle I discussed today, but couldn't really be done without um, work from uh, Santana Silver, Ben Linus, Rahul Kashyap, who helped us with the registry, Mary Lynn Drainoni, Bill Adams, and Nick Bosch, uh, who all took played a major role in the work I presented to you today. Uh, thank you and hope to answer your questions. Um, Thank you, Alan. That was wonderful. It was a, uh, a nice transition from uh, from uh, uh, our plenary speaker, Dr. Cheng, and uh, really kind of focusing us on uh, what's going on on BMC. I had one question for you. Uh, if there's another question in the audience, we'll take at least one because of time, and then we'll give you guys a, a. We'll probably take five minutes from the break, and then we'll we'll come back five minutes from whenever we end with the with the uh, question. So my, my simple question was this, you guys have created a really wonderful infrastructure for, for research uh, using uh, learning health system um, the, um, structure as well as tools. The question is, um, how can clinicians or in the audience are clinician researchers or clinicians that have a burning desire? And there are people from the community in various aspects. How can they connect with with uh, with the CIIS and with uh, this incredible infrastructure that you guys have, have designed as a course of necessity and uh, how can people uh, uh, reach out to you and connect with you great 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 question we hope uh, that people both um, clinicians other researchers community members will reach out to us there's a number of ways our center of implementation improvement science has a website which I will uh, uh, provide um, sites.bu slash CIIS, um, which has ways to contact us. My email, alwalkie at bu.edu, uh, ha happy to reach out there. We provide um, no cost consultations for um, research methodological um, consultation 
through our Center of Implementation Improvement Sciences. And so uh, we hope people will reach out to us with their ideas so we can find ways to partner and start to design um, studies or projects that will help people uh, answer the questions that they want to answer in terms of how can we improve the processes of healthcare delivery in, um, in a way that's rigorous and uh, methodologically sound. So uh, welcome people reaching out to us. Thank you very much. Uh...